Hi, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Parker Chen. Uh, I'm so honored to have a chance to talk about Chinese history in Oxford, obviously. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about an uh, ancient book, not too ancient actually, nowadays you can still buy it in a bookstore. But uh, I'm talking about the history that happened 2,000 years ago. Uh, if any or all of you fall asleep, I won't blame you. That's why. Uh, this book was quite uh, important in uh, Imperial China because it was a mandatory text for anyone who want to take official examination to be uh, government officials. So in Imperial China, it was, a, it was a important text. Okay, so let us start. Okay. Okay. Uh, the Western Han Dynasty, I suppose all of them know when it was, uh, lasted for around 200 years. It was the first supposed to be stable uh, empire in China. It inherited the cultural legacies from um, uh, previous eras that, and in Han Dynasty, it established the five classics, the Wu Jing, uh, which later become mandatory texts for those who wish to take imperial examination. This was so until the fall of the last imperial empire in uh, 1911. In 26 BC, nearly all uh, documents relating to the Qin era uh, underwent editing. This became a crucial turning point of Chinese intellectual history from the uh, more scattered writings to the belief of the totality of a past coherent and cohesive. It also informed the attitude of the classicists during the Han tourist written past, as well as the belief in a long and stable transmission of classical learnings, as well as accepted authority of the classics. This field of uninterrupted transmission and authority has become widely accepted, not only by scholars in traditional China, but also today. The first interpretations of the classics can be say, seen as part of the classics, for they contain the explanation of the allegedly authentic or original meaning of the text. The establishment of the academicians, or Shi, in Han Dynasty, uh, who provided the interpretations of the classics, shows that the classics and the affiliated interpretations were accepted as official learnings. Therefore, the classics themselves were never established. Rather, they became mandatory texts for, for examinations in later dynasty because of the development of different resanctions, uh, or uh, we can call it teaching traditions of the interpretations uh, for, uh, for the classics. So, um, regarding the above mentioned uh, premises, there's uh, the belief of the totality of past coherence and cohesive, we should think about how much consistency can be observed within a, within a resanction in Han Dynasty. Uh, well. So, uh, this uh, presentation will read a story about a direct transmission of first learnings among some academicians recorded in Han historical records, which is one of the very few narratives on the direct transmissions of first learnings. This case will clearly reveal that in the history of resanctions of first interpretation in Han Dynasty, the ascription of a classicist to a specific resanction and their learnings itself can be separated. Therefore, a unifying consistency within one resanction was not exist. Finally, the acknowledgement of this enables us to further investigate the history of the development of the first interpretive resanctions. The story is about uh, Wang Shi. Wang Shi, who studied Lu Shi, is one of the resanctions of uh, first interpretation in Han Dynasty. Under the learning which is long transmitted from this gentleman, Su Shen or Shen Gong, we call him. Uh, Shen Gong was the first academician specialized in the study of Lu Shi. Uh, there were two classicists once consulted Wang Shi about, sorry, I, because I don't, the English translation is too long, so I put the Chinese version there, but I will do the translation now. So, uh, Tang Changbin, this one, 
Tang Changping from Dongping and Chu Shaozun from Pei also came to serve Wang Shi. They asked about a few pieces of classic. After Wang Shi touched them, Wang Shi declined and said, it is all that you heard from teacher. Obviously, he's not a very responsible teacher. Do, he told them, do the glossary and appealing polishing yourself. Then, he then refused to further teach them anymore. Tang and Chu attended, later, attended the election of people of academic Shen this month. I thought uh, I know all, I mean, term, terminologies. So, they approaching academic Shens, they lift up their garments and ascended the imperial court, solemnly recited rituals, testing their ability to recite and explain with standard, and refraining from venturing an opinion if in doubt, even Confucius did not talk about it. Then, it is the most important part. Various academicians startlingly asked whom their teacher, teacher was. They, obviously, they didn't recognize any of their reply in the uh, election. Uh, they replied they had served Wang Shi. Then all of the academicians had long heard about his virtues, heard, long heard about Wang Shi's virtues, and collectively recommended Wang Shi. Then the emperor proclaimed the edict to summon him to the stairs and let him become an academician. Then uh, Mr. Zhang, Mr. Zhang is another classic that didn't mention in this text. Mr. Zhang, Mr. Tang, and Mr. Chu were all appointed academicians. From this point onwards, there exist for Lu Shi the branches of Zhang, Tang, and Chu learnings. So, in historical records, Wang Shi was conversant with the versus was a specialist in uh, Lu Shi teaching. He, however, merely taught a few pieces of the verses uh, at that time, I mean from Han Dynasty up to now, there are total 305 pieces of verses transmitted until nowadays. Uh, he only taught a few pieces uh, of verses to them and then declined to teach more pieces. They were asked to elaborate on the remaining pieces by themselves by polishing them. On the word run se, where is it? This one. Runse, they were, uh, there was a commentary stated, it was all that they heard from a teacher. If dislike the brevity, feel free to uh, further runse the uh, verses. Uh, the commentary, if dislike the brevity, can precisely describe Wang Shi's own idea to his teaching. Why did Wang Shi need to suggest Tang and Chu to runse if Wang had already touched the whole Lu Shi. He could have merely replied them, it was, it was all that you heard from, from a teacher. Do the glossary and appealing, polishing yourself. Uh, you can see that from this, uh, from this uh, reply, reflects that even Wang Shi himself also understood the content of his teaching. In terms of both uh, peace coverage and explanation, uh, was sketchy and inadequate for them in the long run, whether to further their academic pursuits or as a vocational skill. So, actually, I'm just to this, take this chance to raise some questions to you. Uh, from the story, we can clearly see that the Lu Shi was not transmitted in full version. Only a few pieces of verses were transmitted. It is imaginable imaginable that the training in Lu Shi that Tang Yanshu received was not only uh, confined to a few pieces, but also sketchy in content. It is hard to imagine how they merely rely on these few pieces and sketchy explanation to attend the election of people of academic Shen. But the historical record uh, is, however, they not only were they knowledgeable enough to win the election, and they also startled the, the academicians, promoting them to ask about their teacher-student affiliations and eventually were appointed them as Lu Shi academicians. So a doubt is raised. What caused the academicians to react in this way? To answer this, we need to investigate the replies made by them in the imperial court. But this answer, however, cannot be directly found in the 
uh, historic records unless newly excavated records are found. The content of their responses in the election will, will probably be buried in history forever. But an alternative, indirect answer might be, Tang and Chu replied with Lu Shi at the imperial court. This is because from historical records, they were students of Wang Shi. And, uh, Lu, uh, and more importantly, they were appointed Lu Shi academicians eventually. This answer presumed that they had used uh, in their replies to Lu Shi that was inherited from Shen Gong and Wang Shi. However, this is not a satisfactory answer. If we make this assumption uh, and admit that uh, Tang and Chu replied with Lu Shi at the imperial court, the following uh, interrelated questions need to be answered. So, did various academicians at that, uh, who were contemporary of Tang and Chu should be at the time around Han Xuan Di, around 74 to 49 BC? Are they knowing nothing or very little about the branch of Lu Shi learnings that was inherited from Shen Gong? Sec the second question is, was Wang Shi's Lu Shi, Lu Shi learning problematic, not living up to the standard of Shen Gong's grand students when he taught the verses? Was it under these circumstances that uh, the academicians were unable to recognize from Tang and Chu's replies the Lu Shi learning which was long inherited from Shen Gong? If, the last question. If the answer of the above two questions are no, the following questions should be answered. Did Tang and Chu respond at the election with the Lu Shi accepted at that time? If the answer is yes, why did various academicians startingly ask whom their teacher was, given that they know very well about Wang Shi? If the answer is no, why were Tang and Chu recognized as Lu Shi academicians eventually. What was the relationship between them and Lu Shi? Do I still have time to give brief answers? <laughs> this is a bit complicated. For the first uh, question, uh, there are lots of different <laughs> records about it. Uh, I will say that at that time, the contemporary academicians should know very well about Lu Shi learning because there are some very famous Lu Shi teachers at that time. One of them was Wei Xian. Wei Xian taught the verses to the emperor. That, that means he was the uh, teacher of the, uh, taught the Lu Shi to the emperor. And he was also a chancellor in Xuan Di that was the contemporary of Tang and Chu. So the contemporary uh, uh, classicists should know quite well about Lu Shi learning, at least from Wei Xian. And another, the second, I mean the second question is Wang Shi's Lu Shi learning. Wang Shi's learning is, uh, we talked about Wei Xian just a few seconds ago. Wei Xian and Wang Shi's uh, teacher-student affiliation is a little bit similar with, uh, I mean they are quite similar. Lu Xusheng was recorded as he preserved the learning from Shen Gong. He is the first Lu Shi uh, classicist in Han Dynasty. So Wang Shi's Lu Shi learning and contemporary uh, classicists should know quite well about, uh, no, should know quite well about uh, uh, Lu Shi. So the last question, I'm not going to answer now because it's running out of time. The answer is, I use a German, how to call that, portmanteau is yai. Yes, there are some, some people here know German. It's the combination of yes and no. In German, yes is ja, no is nein, so it's a yai. They uh, reply, <laughs> oh yes, I use it in my, I mean, in my real dissertation. Just my teacher was, uh, is a uh, German. Um, he, they, they inherited some Lu Shi learnings, but obviously they developed their own interpretation of Lu Shi, but it hindered not they became Lu Shi classicists. It is another topic that needs to be investigated later. I, in my, okay, in my title, I used Shadow of Turning. It is actually from Bible, from the King James Version. It, uh, it used, 
uh, there is no shadow of turning to describe. There is no variableness uh, in heavenly God. But I'm using it in a completely different way that to describe Han Dynasty's resanction of classical learnings is, uh, I put it, every good gift and every perfect gift is from early China and cometh down from the classicists with whom are lots of variableness and shadows of turning. Okay, thank you so much. Is there any of our presentation? <laughs>